Good evening. Welcome to the Bridgewood Church of Christ. All those who are here to, uh, in person and those online, we welcome you. Um, thank you for coming back and joining us. Um, I haven't received any new updates, uh, but we'll go ahead and get into that in a second. Um, again, welcome as uh, we're getting our minds prepared to worship. Let's make sure we've got everything locked in in our minds, uh, like phones off, things like that, and uh, try and focus our minds more towards uh, God at this moment. Um, regarding the prayer updates, uh, Phyllis Clay has uh, asked prayers for her son-in-law, Manny, who has had another aneurysm and will require another surgery uh, for that, so keep uh, Manny in your prayers. Uh, Jean Simpson is going to have hip replacement surgery um, this week, so uh, she would appreciate prayers. And um, the good news is Annette's mom returned home and was been able to walk back and forth to her neighbor's house and get to say hi. So uh, keep her in your prayers for continued recovery, but um, a prayer of thanksgiving for her to be able to get home. Uh, pack the pantries this Thursday at 1030. Um, need some volunteers. Uh, most of the other volunteers that are the regulars are out this week. Um, and then Robert has the seed bomb class this upcoming Saturday um, at 3 p.m. If you were unable to sign in this morning, you can scan the QR code that'll pop up either now or at the end, and you can always grab one of the cards in the pew back in front of you. So, go ahead and start working. Good evening. First song is going to be number 532, 532, Praise Him, Praise Him. <clears throat>
Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing over this wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and thank you for the blessings that you give us and thank you for this opportunity to come before you and worship you and uh, praise uh, you with our, our words and our actions. And Lord, we ask that you be with us, give us the wisdom uh, from you and that we require from reading your word. And <clears throat> Lord, we just Thank you for your word and your son and the, the blessing that that is in our lives that allows us to uh, have that hope of eternal life with you, Lord. Lord, we ask that you watch over us and protect us and help us to be aware of the, the workings of the, of the devil and his temptations and his snares and traps that he throws in front of us and help us to be on the lookout for that and to avoid those that will come our way. Lord, we ask that you be with uh, the men in this congregation that lead their, their families and are raising 
young ones, we just ask that you be with them, help them to uh, make the right decisions and, and have the wisdom to raise up uh, servants of you. Lord, we ask that you be with the elders here, help them to uh, be wise in the decisions that they make and to lead us in the right directions to help us get to you, but also to help us uh, grow and mature in your faith and and to be able to reach out to those that are around us and spread the word and everything we know with, with those that uh, we come in contact with. Lord, we ask that you be with those that are on our prayer list. We know there are many that are, are struggling with illnesses and other uh, afflictions, and Lord, we just ask that you be with them and uh, help them. Lord, we know that you, that there are here some here that are, are struggling with sin and uh, different things that grip them, and Lord, we just ask that you be with them and help them to work through that and know that there is a, an escape from it, that you always offer that pathway out. Lord, we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. I'll be reading from 2 Corinthians 5. Verses 17 through 19. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of re reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Well, good evening. I'm glad that you're back tonight. I hope that you had a uh, good evening. I will tell you that uh, there is nothing better for me than a Sunday afternoon nap with golf playing in the background. I, I don't know what it is. I love playing golf. I love everything, uh, you know, the kind of the tradition that's around the Masters and all those things are associated. But as soon as it comes on the TV, I am out cold. And, uh, and so I was glad to be able to turn the TV on for a little while this afternoon and let it do its thing so I could get a nap. But uh, we're glad you're back tonight, and we're glad to continue studying. We're going to be in that text where, where Robert was. We're going to continue this evening in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. But before we get there, uh, let me just uh, expand a little bit more on something we talked about this morning. A pantry that's coming up, of course, that is happening this Thursday, so I don't want to confuse dates, but this Thursday, 10.30 in the morning, we will have Pack the Pantry. Now, Ricky's going to be driving the truck for us this time, and so we appreciate that. And again, any help that we can give would be great. But in addition to April 18th, this Thursday, two weeks from that, we're going to have our new pickup date for Pack the Pantry. It's going to, we're moving from the third Thursday to the first Thursday of the month, and there's a reason. So our next one will be May 2nd, pretty close together. Um, but when we filled out um, their agency survey and we talked about the amount of food that we're getting and how many people we're helping, they placed us in their top tier of distribution points for Midwest Food Bank. I think that's exciting. So we are pulling in, uh, you know, what started with about seven months ago, as uh, we kind of threw about a pallet and a half into our church van, now we're running a truck and we're getting anywhere from six to eight pallets of food. Midwest is also experiencing a great um, boom in the number of agencies that are working with them, and so they are restructuring their schedule to make sure that those agencies that are being uh, most effective get to go earlier in the month while they have their best supply of, of items with nutritional value to give away. So I'm excited that we are now in that first week in the top tier of, of what Midwest is doing. I look forward to continuing that partnership. This last week, I had a call from uh, Jake Hysaw, who's one of the ministers over at the Meadowview Church of Christ in Mesquite. And Jake, uh, we've known each other for quite a while, Jake and his dad, Mike, uh, the both ministers there at, at Meadowview. And uh, Jake was asking a lot of questions about um, the pop-up because they want to start something similar over at Mesquite. And so that would be another congregation in the area that is using the similar ideas. 
each making it their own, something that will work for their area, to reach out into their community and hopefully to experience the same amount of connection that we have experienced here at, at Bridgewood. And so I'm excited for, for those opportunities, um, but again, we could sure use your help this Thursday. So into the text we go. Uh, remember that last uh, Sunday evening when we were right next door there in the fellowship hall, we were uh, in the first half of 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. And toward the end of that text, Paul gave us uh, this perfect illustration. Paul, again, punctuates uh, so much of the text and the lessons that he's teaching in these letters with a great uh, example, a great illustration. And so Paul talking about the tent, of course, Paul himself, a tent maker, uh, giving the illustration of, of a temporary dwelling place in this tent that we have other places in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 referring to this same tent as a jar of clay or an earthen vessel highlighting how temporary all of this is that we think seems to be so permanent just temporary and so Paul there will pick up in verses 9 and 10 to get a running start at our text tonight so whether we are at home or away we make it our aim to please him, to please God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So you'll recall that these things that we studied last week, they were not meant to discourage. But in fact, these were written, these were told, these were relayed spoken so that we would be encouraged to be the people that we are supposed to be so that the christians in corinth too would be the people that that they should be because there is a goal and so we look at ourselves and we think what is our goal we may have any sort uh, any number of goals that we're trying to achieve in life but in everything that we do as a christian there is one ultimate goal to be in heaven to go to heaven at the end of this life to be found pleasing when we come before that judgment seat that bema seat of christ and to be found in that condition that's our goal for ourselves but then as we're going to see as we continue through this text looking at the role that we have been given we recognize that our role isn't just for us but it spreads to those around us it spreads to those who we're married to those who are in our family first making sure that that each one of us our spouse our family we're on the same path we're heading towards heaven our church family it widens out that we're helping one another uh, get to heaven. Just as Sister DeBose asked for our prayers this morning to have strength to, to do the things that, that she wants to do in the name of Christ, we support her in that and we encourage her in that as we do all who are facing challenges and difficulties in life. We're not just taking prayer requests to fill time, but because we know the power of prayer. And we move on beyond that, moving out into our community, into our schools, into our workplaces, because we have been given a task. We have been given a a ministry, a message that we love to tell. And so that's our goal. And we ended last week in verse 11, which is really part of our text tonight, but there is that connecting word at the front of it, therefore... Knowing the fear of the Lord, your version might say the terror of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. Now there was some difficulty, as we've talked about before. We talked about it uh, in, when we were studying in 1 Corinthians. We've been talking about it as we've been studying through 2 Corinthians as well. There were some tensions between the Christians in Corinth and Paul. There were a few people 
in that number among the church at Corinth who had made some accusations against Paul and much of that had been put behind them by the time that 2 Corinthians is written. It had been resolved. Titus had brought back this very favorable report that encouraged Paul greatly. But Paul, not hiding from the fact that God knows his heart. And we're reminded, too, that God knows our heart. For we are known to God. Again, not something that should be a source of fear for us, but something that really should be encouraging to us. All the difficulties that we face, we don't have to keep those hidden in a closet or in the dark somewhere under a rug because God already knows them. We don't have to worry and fear, oh no, God is going to find out because God already knows and so we might as well live with that knowledge and know, too, that, that he cares. And God wants the best for us and has provided opportunity for us and has provided hope for us through his son, through the word and through the church. And so we have to be engaged and we can't delude ourselves, making sure it's known to our conscience, too. We uh, think about in our text, this fear, or your translation might say terror of the Lord. And we realize that if it weren't for Jesus Christ, if it weren't for the hope that is made possible through the blood of Christ, we would not have escaped from the certain fear, the certain terror of judgment just as death passed by the households of the israelites all that time ago the households that followed the instruction of god the households that marked blood on the doorposts as the tenth plague took place so long ago we too are marked by the blood of jesus and it is a blessed thing to have been cleansed, to have been marked for the terror of the Lord, the terror of the judgment to pass by it. And so it's because of that opportunity. It's because of that blessing that we persuade men and women to give their lives over to the Lord. We do not want people to be lost we do not want any to fall into the hands of judgment unprepared. And so we stay motivated and, and we really carry with the message, let me show you the way. When we are trying our best to share the hope that we have found. We keep with us in our mind always. This idea that we are here as Christians to persuade men. Sometimes that man that we are trying to pursue, persuade is the one that we see in the mirror. Sometimes the one that we are here to persuade is the one who is our spouse that we have committed our lives to. Sometimes the one that we are trying to persuade is our own children, but we continue on in these things, aiming towards the goal of heaven. We are not simply casting out ideas and words just to hear them, but with a purpose for people to respond to those words. We should follow the example of Paul and passionately desire. Make it our number one aim of all the things that we do that men and women would come to be faithful to God through Jesus Christ. And we're reminded too, uh, both uh, in, in this text and back in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12, that we studied just a few weeks ago, that what we are is known to God. In verse 12 the, of chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, the example was, was looking in a mirror. Again, Paul providing a, a vivid image that we can carry with us to remind us 
that we can bring to mind easily. We might not be able to bring to mind the the book, the chapter, the verse, but we can remember Paul talked about seeing ourselves dimly in a mirror. But then we shall see ourselves just as God does. No hiding, no delusion, but the truth of who we are. And that God knows all of us our hopes and our fears, our desires and our motivations. Continuing on in our text for tonight in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12, we read this. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart you might be reading that text and and wonder exactly what what is Paul talking about it helps to understand a little bit of the context of again of what's going on in Corinth and and to realize that then and now many people would look at Paul Someone who will study about next Sunday, the same text in 2 Corinthians, or a different text in 2 Corinthians, but the text where he outlines, lists all the different things that he had suffered for the cause of Christ. And so someone would look at Paul back then and think someone who's having so much trouble, someone who's being so persecuted, must be doing something wrong. But they were judging on outward appearances. Paul, making it clear, he knew who he was. His conscience was clean before God, and the things that he endured, the sufferings that they were judging him by on an outward appearance, were actually marks of his extreme faith in God. They were judging by outward appearance. They were looking for those who who looked like they were having great success, but really... They were whitewashed tombs. They were nothing but a fake facade. We're reminded from the Old Testament of 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 17. For the Lord does not see as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God, who was the same in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and today, looks into the heart of all mankind and sees us as we truly are. There are times where our earthly wisdom or even our intuition, right, stands in sharp contrast to who God really wants us to be. So we constantly train ourselves to see ourselves and to see the world as God sees it by studying in his word so that we can be the ministers of reconciliation that we are called to be in our text tonight by Paul. Verses 13 through 15. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it's for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this that one has died for all, and therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might, not, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Picking a few thoughts from this section of Scripture, to be beside yourself, as Paul is using the phrase here in the English Standard Version, of course, describes someone who is crazy who is out of their mind we see that in the next section of that verse if if we're in our right mind a rational behavior is what paul is talking about and of course in experiencing such pain such suffering people think well he must be crazy but of course maybe he was in regards to the standards of earthly thinking willing to do anything possible 
to relay to those who needed to hear the hope of the gospel, recognizing that this was just a tent. And if the tent is taken down, there's a permanent dwelling place prepared for him and living in that fullness always. Of course, Paul was in good company by being called out of his mind. Jesus himself was referred to in John chapter 10, verse 20, and also Mark chapter 3, verse 21. He was accused of being crazy as well. And so there will be times where people think, you must be crazy to believe what you do. Maybe so. But my hope, my trust, my faith is in God who spoke this world, this universe, into existence out of nothing. And so we have the same hope that Paul did. And we have the same motivation too. He said that the motivation, the love of Christ. That is what motivated, even pushed him when he was filled with fear, as we've seen in this text, when he was about ready to give up. So what should compel each one of us as ministers of reconciliation? The knowledge that we have of God. The essential foundation that we want to give something to others because Jesus gave us everything. And so we continue on. If someone were to ask Paul, why are you doing this? Why live this way? Why give up everything that you gave up? He would tell them in one way or another, I have to. I have to because there are those who need to know and who need to receive the love of Christ. Paul also reminds us that we have the love of Christ, the joy of that knowledge in our lives. And so we need to be motivated to, to share it. You know, going back to the Old Testament again, just as Jacob toiled for Rachel year after year, motivated by love, to have her as his wife, so also do true saints toil year after year just as many of you have because we are the bride of Christ we understand his love for us and his love motivates us to prepare ourselves and others to confront the fear of the Lord it's also worth noting that in this text is found the the root of a, of a false notion, a false teaching referred to as universalism. Universalism, of course, is that Jesus died for all and therefore all have died and there's nothing we can do to change that. It's already been done. But as each of you know well, when we take just one verse like this one and we pluck it out, and we, we pin all our hopes on one verse, it's not accurate. We see, and, and there's in fact a universalist church less than a mile from here, we see that when we view the entire message of the gospel, that the idea of universalism, taking this one verse out of context and saying, well, we're good, Christ died, for all of us, we're already good. By taking this one verse out of context, we've, we've taken out the idea that's clearly brought forth in Scripture that we have to hear the Word. In fact, what we're talking about tonight, the idea that we are ministers of reconciliation, the idea that we are charged with taking the Word into the world, if that is what Paul was teaching, that we're already saved, there's nothing we can do to change it, then why would Paul talk about it? being ministers of the reconciliation, being those who have this word to share with others. So we know that they have to hear it. That's up to us. Then their choice is to believe it. A universalist would tell us that there is no point in even believing in Jesus. Right? Because that decision has already been made. 
we see very quickly how this line of thought just unravels with a very basic understanding of the New Testament, opening up and reading just about anywhere you want to in the New Testament. Then, of course, there has to be change. A repentance, right? Recognizing that the way that we've been living must change. We must turn and run away from those things. The universalist would tell you, no, we don't have to. We just keep doing whatever we want to do. I remember uh, years ago, we had uh, some folks who were visiting from that local universalist congregation. They were coming with us on a Sunday evening, and I was giving a lesson, and I was talking about media at the time. We used to talk about media quite a bit. And I was talking about a, a purging that I had done of my own personal uh, DVDs and games and things like that, and things I was getting rid of when I observed them with a more careful eye. And this individual who was from the Universalist Church asked if they could come and have these things because there was nothing wrong with viewing these things because it all didn't matter. I said, well, no, you can't have them because they're trash. And so we recognize that, that time and again, as we look at Scripture, we see the plan. We see our role as ministers of that, and we see very clearly that, yes, Christ died for all. But we must join with him, as we're told in Romans chapter 6, as Paul paints clearly, by hearing, by, hearing, by believing. By repenting, by confessing, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He died so that I could know freedom, being baptized for the remission of our sins, and then living faithfully as a minister of the reconciliation, each one of us. We continue on in our text. Let me make sure I got way off my notes, make sure I'm in the right place here. I am. We're in good shape. We're in verse 16. From now on, Paul writes, Therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. I love this, this phrase, this, this thought that Paul has presented, that, that those who were there at this time would have known Jesus in the flesh, could have. Or could have at least known someone who had seen Jesus, who had directly interacted with Jesus, but no longer. That's where we find ourselves. This, of course, not the only place in this letter where Paul references this idea. If you wanted to jot down a few of these references, uh, they're, I think they're all in chapter 4 and 5 of 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18, Paul wrote, Because we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Earlier in this chapter, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, talking about the earthly tent, it will be destroyed, but we will have a new body, eternal, in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Because we walk by faith and not by sight. And even in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 12, which we've already looked at tonight, because we do not glory in appearance, but we glory in heart. There are some, perhaps even us, who have thought, I really wish that Jesus were here right now. And I, I understand that longing. There's nothing wrong with having that longing to, to wish. We're, when we're in some of the, the deepest, darkest places in our life, to wish that Jesus were with us right now. There, there's nothing wrong with that, that sentiment. But what we see in the words of Jesus himself is that he had to leave. He had to go. So God's plan could advance. Right down next to this passage, uh, John chapter 16, verse 7. So next to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16, jot down John chapter 16, verse 7, where Jesus said, It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, 
I will send him to you. God's plan ever advancing on, not an accident, not an afterthought, not, not some kind of mistake, but a plan since before creation that runs until after all of this that we've known as being so solid is dissolved and gone away. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, Therefore, again, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Do you take great hope and great comfort in the word anyone? Anyone. Doesn't matter what class of person you are it doesn't matter where you're from it doesn't matter what language you speak it doesn't matter what you've done anyone can be a new creation made new in Christ to move forward as God's child brothers and sisters in the body of Christ and this promise that we speak of this promise that we read of is to the people who are in Christ. Note that the promise is not to people who are in themselves. Right? In and of ourselves, we can do none of this. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot be good enough. We cannot say the right things. It's because of Christ. Christ. That we are able to be all these things, so we persuade others to join us in this walk as a new creation. But don't forget that the old man constantly struggles to come back. I know that Robert will appreciate the example I have in mind, and many of you will too, when we think about the new creation I think about that freshly tilled garden soil. It's tilled over, and, and when you're done, it looks beautiful. Healthy dirt, the, the best dirt you can think of, ready to grow, and we plant that seed in the dirt. But as that seed is germinating, and the action that God has made for that seed to spring to life works beneath the soil, something else is working too. Weeds from the old dirt are starting to pop up too. And so they must be pulled away, they must be dealt with, or they will choke out that growth, as our Lord taught us in that parable. We recognize the importance that, yes, we are a new creation, but we are a creation that is constantly working, that is constantly going back to the Creator so that the old man doesn't show up again. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24, we learn to put off the old man, to take him off, put him away, and to put on the new man, which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. A changed person. I believe it is fair to say that the work of making man a new creation is just as amazing if not more so than the fact that God created this world by speaking it into existence we talk about creation often it is a, a fascinating concept I know that, that Travis loves to to talk about it, teach it, and to work through the, the apologetics of, of creation. But we recognize, too, that the God who made it possible for us to be a new creation, that, too, deserves our attention. It deserves our efforts to share. Here is what changed me, and it can change you, too. There will be obstacles. 
There will be our stubborn wills to overcome. There will be deep prejudices. There will even be a love of evil that we have all around us and sometimes in our heart too. All of these things will wage war against the souls of men. But we have the ultimate victory possible through Jesus Christ. Thanks to our Father God. Verses 18 through 19, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us, brothers and sisters, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting, counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of, of reconciliation. When we open the word, when we approach Bible study, when we consider the scripture, do we remember? Do we keep always in our thought, in our mind, in our heart that this message has been entrusted to me. It has changed my life, and so it's been entrusted to me to use accurately, to use rightly, to share with others. Not to sit on a shelf in our homes, not to wait in the trunk of the car, but for us to use daily for ourselves, knowing that the old man's constantly warring against us, and knowing that there are those around us who desperately need to hear this message that you and I enjoy. We have been given this ministry. We have been given this hope. All of it made possible by God through Jesus Christ. And the message he entrusted to us. What a tremendous blessing it is that we should never forget that we, as we read in verse 20, are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. And so we implore you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. Again, Paul gives us this amazing visual of an ambassador. An ambassador is one who is from a foreign land, who has been stationed there to represent that foreign land. An ambassador, by title, by understanding the role, is to be the best representative in action, in word, in everything that is done of the place where they are from. Men shouldn't pick an ambassador lightly. And God most certainly has not picked us as ambassadors lightly because he paid with the blood of his own son so that we could be ambassadors of the kingdom. This world, this place, is not the country that we are going home to. We love our country. We love this place where we are. But we are ambassadors here to represent. We are ambassadors here with our words, whether it's the words that we speak, whether it's the things that we say online, whether it's the way that we keep company. We recognize that we are here to spread the reputation of God to spread the hope of God and to call all people, as Paul has already said, to be reconciled to God. And so considering ourselves as ambassadors, as ministers of reconciliation, are we bringing honor to our heavenly home? How are we doing as ambassadors of Christ? Our final verse from our text tonight, verse 21. For our sake... It's you and me. For our sake, he made him to be sin 
who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Not so that we might know the righteousness of God, not so that we might have been touched by the righteousness of God, so that we could become the righteousness of God. Those words, when we fully breathe them in, when we understand them, when they prick us in the heart, realize that, yes, God removed the sin from our lives. Yes, God has changed us. God has saved us through Christ. But in all of that, we have been able to become the righteousness of God. And so we are motivated more and more every day, I hope, to be those who understand the role that we have as ministers, not the one who is reconciling. That work has already been done. God did that through Jesus Christ. But to be those who carry that message forward as ambassadors in everything that we do. Are we going to be perfect? Absolutely not. We're going to have days where we struggle just to keep our own car in the lane as we're traveling down this road of life. But more and more in our life, we need to make sure that we are where we're supposed to be so that we can start guiding others to come with us. I hope tonight that just as I have been, you are stirred by the words that Paul gave us to consider of this great blessing that we have in God, of this great opportunity. We always extend to the body when we are here and to those who are visiting with us, the opportunity that if you have been stirred by the words of God in this letter written by Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, if you have been stirred by Paul's message, by God's message, don't leave here unchanged. And if you need the help of the church in study, in prayer, in putting on Christ in baptism, we stand ready as a church, as the ambassadors of Christ, to help you. If you have a need tonight, let the church know how we can help by coming forward. Let's have a conversation as we stand and sing. Unable to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, it has been left ready for you. If you make your way towards the back at this time, there will be some gentlemen there to serve you while we sing our next song. <clears throat> that song will be number 397, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. And we'll sing the first and last verse of this song.
pray father god as we come before your throne of grace lord we're just so thankful that you're allowing us to be here another day lord we thank you for our health our strength we thank you for sending your son to that cruel rugged cross that we may have the right to everlasting life and lord we just want to pray for everybody that's on the prayer list that's recovering from surgeries and those that are about to go to surgeries lord we ask you to just put your hands on the surgeon's hands and let have be in the right mind that the surgery may be a success and Lord, we just want to pray for the caregivers and the hospitals and also the ones that's at home that's taking care of the loved ones. And Lord, we just want to pray for our families tonight that they may have harmony, Lord. And we pray for our kids that's going to school tomorrow that they may get to school safe. And we always want to pray for our teachers that they continue to teach our students relentless hours. Lord, we ask you to give the teachers a break. And Lord, we just pray for the leadership here at the Bridgewood Church of Christ that we may keep on being in the right direction. And we always want to pray for our missionaries that go overseas and take the words to some countries that it's illegal to spread. Lord, we just ask you to continue to bless the missionaries and pray for the families that support them. And as we're going home today, Lord, we ask you to take us safe without the hurt or harm of anybody on these freeways, Lord. And we wake up tomorrow, Lord, we ask you to let us be the best representative we can and always look for representative to spread your words. Look for opportunities to spread your words. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our closing song, let's stand as we sing number 595. We'll, stand, we'll sing the first and last verse. Stand.